I am Shannon Burnett with Alumni Relations, and I'm excited to host my first faculty spotlight for the Traveling Owls program. Um, so tonight you'll be hearing from Professor Christopher Johns Kroll, who is the faculty leader for the 2022 trip exploring Chile and the skies of the Southern Hemisphere. This trip is being facilitated by our tour operator, Royal Adventures, and joining us tonight from their office is Carla White and John Royal. So if you guys wanna say hello or wave. <laughs> um, and while myself, Carla and John are on the call with y'all, the focus of tonight's event really is for you all to get to know Professor John Scroll. Um, he's gonna start out with a presentation on himself and his research, research interests and experiences. And while he's presenting, I highly encourage you to utilize the Q&A or chat features to post any questions that you've got for him. And then once he's done with his presentation, I'll circle back and make sure we get answers for those. You're also welcome to wait and take yourself off mute at the end of his presentation and ask him questions directly. Definitely can be a dialogue. I really want you guys to get to know how great uh, he is and how um, perfectly matched he is for this trip as well. I do ask that you please remain on mute unless asking a question at the end to kind of cut down on background noise and to allow for those that might be viewing in speaker mode to view the presenter still. And a friendly reminder that any specific trip-based questions should be addressed to Royal Adventures or Traveling Owls and preferably after this event. Again, we want you to spend this time with Professor John Scroll. So, and now it is my privilege, privilege and pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Christopher John Scroll. You can take it away. Okay, thank you. So um, I did prepare a, a presentation, PowerPoint presentation to give you a flavor of some of the things about me and the research I do. Um, is everybody seeing that in the presentation mode? Okay, good. Yep, we see. All right, thank you. Oops. Go All right. So, um, so a little bit uh, about me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm originally from Dallas. I uh, was born and raised in uh, Dallas and lived there until I went to college. Um, so and for my undergraduate uh, college, I went to the University of Texas. So I was in Austin uh, for four years. And from there, I went uh, west to the University of California, Berkeley in the Bay Area, where I did my PhD. I got my master's and my PhD uh, at Berkeley. Um, and then after Berkeley, I actually went back to Austin for a postdoc, um, did a uh, a year in Colorado, then moved back to the Bay Area as a research scientist, uh, and finally came to Rice after um, uh, being in, back in Berkeley for about four years. And so I came to Rice in 2001 uh, and have been here ever since. So uh, as was mentioned, I am a professor uh, in the physics and astronomy department. And, but I've been very interested in astronomy um, for, for much longer than my professional career, much longer than graduate school. Um, uh, one of the things that I do uh, in, in my job besides teaching and, and doing research is I serve as an advisor for incoming students. Uh, I'm what we call one of our natural science divisional advisors for Brown College. Um, and what we try to do is, is to assure students that if you don't know what you want to do with your life when you first come to college, that's okay. Uh, college is meant to be a time of exploration and kind of figuring that out. But I'm not a good example of that. I, I fell in love with astronomy when I was nine years old, uh, when I was given a telescope that looks something like this, a TASCO telescope um, <clears throat> uh, for Christmas. Um, I had that for a few years, could see, you know, in Dallas with a small telescope, uh, the, the thing about telescopes that is kind of sort of most important is their diameter. How much light do, we, do they let in? We think of telescopes as, as light collecting buckets. And so if you think about, you know, rain falling, if you have a bigger bucket, you're going to collect more water. And so the same is true of telescopes. If you have a bigger uh, aperture telescope, you're going to collect more light, you're going to be able to see fainter and fainter things. So this telescope wasn't all that uh, great in terms of its size, but I could see planets uh, of the solar system, could see the rings of Saturn that you see here. Now, 
when I'm showing there's a Hubble Space Telescope picture, so my little telescope didn't show up nearly quite so good. But um, it, it was enough to get me hooked. And so I saved up uh, lots of money and graduated to an even bigger telescope. So that first telescope was maybe two and a half inches in diameter. The next telescope I bought was six inches in diameter. Um, <clears throat> and this is actually not a picture of my telescope, but it's one of the same type of telescope that I pulled off the web. Uh, and this was back when I was in middle school that I uh, got this telescope. And, and this is the advertisement for that telescope pulled from the pages of Sky and Telescope, which was the, the main amateur astronomer magazine uh, that um, was published then and it's still published now. Um, and so I, I bought this six inch dinoscope, as you can see there for $194, which was a lot of money to a middle school kid way back when. Um, but it was a fantastic telescope uh, and it allowed me to see um, things like Saturn uh, and Jupiter and, and what we call deep sky objects, um, the nebulae and the galaxies and the star clusters and other things that you can see with a, with a good small telescope. And that really convinced me that astronomy is what I wanted to do. Um, and I did my best to to pursue a career that would uh, let me do that. And so when I went to UT, I majored, uh, I got a Bachelor of Science in Physics. I also got a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics. I graduated from there in 1989 and uh, did my PhD in astronomy, master's in my PhD in astronomy and graduated in 1994 from uh, the University of California, Berkeley. So <clears throat> I didn't really start playing with bigger telescopes than, than what I showed you until I went to graduate school. So some of the telescopes that I, I get to play with are shown here. Uh, the one in the middle is uh, the main telescope at Lick Observatory in um, California. It is one of the University of California telescopes. So it is the, the main telescope that, that I did a lot of my thesis research on. And so whereas my little six inch dinoscope here was six inches in diameter, the mirror on this telescope is 120 inches in diameter to give you a sense of scale. And in fact, here's a person down here to, to give you a sense of scale in this picture. And then when I went to uh, Austin as a postdoc after I graduated, and still now I regularly use uh, the telescopes out of McDonald Observatory. And this is uh, the largest of the ones that I regularly use. This is the 107 inch telescope. Uh, or the 2.7 meter astronomers that will often describe the, the size of the telescopes, the diameter of the telescopes, either in inches or meters. So the, the telescope at Lick was three meters in diameter, and this one is 2.7 um, meters in diameter. <clears throat> and even though I uh, have been able to pursue astronomy, you know, professionally throughout my professional career, one of the, the unfortunate um, realities of the way you do astronomy these days uh, is that you don't, you almost never actually look through the telescope. Uh, a computer is looking through the telescope in some way. A computer is taking a picture through the telescope. A computer is taking a, a spectrum through the telescope. You uh, rarely get to uh, look at it uh, through with your own eyes. And that is something that astronomers actually like to do. And so one of the kind of the funniest stories I have from my professional career it, it occurred really when I was in graduate school, the end of my graduate studies. But many of you may remember back in 1994, uh, there was a comet, Shoemaker-Levy 9, that broke up into several pieces as it was orbiting the sun. It came near Jupiter and it was Jupiter's gravitational tug that caused the comet to split apart and break up into many little chunks. And then the next year around, so in 1994, when the comet swung back by and, and got near Jupiter, all of these individual little chunks plowed into the surface of Jupiter over the course of several days and created these little uh, <clears throat> scar looking things <clears throat> as they punctured the cloud deck and exploded in the upper cloud deck. And so pretty much every professional telescope in the world uh, was looking at Jupiter during this process, during this whole time. Because uh, since the comet was penetrating deep into the, the planet and was, as a result, spewing material up into the upper parts of the atmosphere of Jupiter, 
we were able to study and learn things about Jupiter that we hadn't really been able to, to do before. So in particular, this three meter telescope at Lick Observatory, this is the dome of it you can see over here on the right, was looking at Jupiter. Of course, it was the, the computers that were actually doing it. So I took my little six inch telescope. Uh, I was not part of the team that was using the telescope for this because my research is, is on stars and extrasolar planets, not, not the planets of our solar system. But I took my little six inch telescope and set it up in the parking lot right outside the dome of this 120 inch telescope and trained it on Jupiter. And you could see these little spots on Jupiter as the comet was plowing into it. Um, and so every astronomer and technician who was in the three meter telescope dome came out to look through my little six inch telescope so they could actually see the thing with their own eyes because they couldn't do that with this much, much bigger much, much fancier telescope. So I like to, to advertise that as a case when, when bigger is not always better. Sometimes you need a small little workhorse to do what you want to do. So these are uh, you know, some of the telescopes I've used. Uh, and more recently, um, my research has involved a number of other telescopes <clears throat> uh, and including some in Chile. And I show here in the top left, uh, the Gemini 8-meter telescope, which is one of the largest telescopes in Chile. <clears throat> um, it is um, at Cerro Patron, and I'll show a map in a moment. Uh, this is a 3.6-meter telescope uh, uh, in La Silla. Um, this is one of the European Southern Observatories telescopes. So Gemini is a consortium, an international consortium with the United States as, as, the, as the dominant uh, country in the consortium. Uh, this, though, is, is part of the European uh, system of telescopes. In the upper right here, this is uh, now called the Lowell Discovery Telescope. This is outside of Flagstaff, owned and operated by uh, Lowell Observatory, but I uh, work with a team of scientists at Lowell to do a lot of my research. And then this is a telescope here um, on top of Mauna Kea. This is a NASA telescope. This is called the Infrared Telescope Facility or we call it the IRTF for short. And, um, you know, for scale, you can see here's a couple of cars at this observatory, here's a SUV at this observatory. Um, <clears throat> as I said, this is eight meters in diameter, this one's 3.6, this is 4.3 meters in diameter, and this one's three meters in diameter. But then of course, most recently one of the <clears throat> main observing facilities that is now, um, kind of the, one of the most desirable uh, facilities to use is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. So this is also in Chile, uh, and this is one of the things that I believe we're gonna see on this trip. Um, and it is an array of many radio telescopes, uh, but for the most part, they work together uh, to provide images that are much uh, sharper than any one telescope could uh, provide. Um, and uh, a lot of really exciting discoveries over the past uh, few years have been made with um, ALMA. So one of the things that, that you know you may have noticed from some of the pictures I've shown and you've probably uh, seen from your interest in astronomy in general is that astronomers like to build telescopes on tall mountains. And uh, there's a good reason for that. It's not just that we like to go to scenic places. Uh, you want to be able to build your telescopes such that they are above as much of the Earth's atmosphere as possible uh, for a couple of different reasons, because the Earth's atmosphere um, has some turbulence in it. it uh, if you think about you know, driving down the highway, uh, and you see the heat rising off of the road in front of you, and it creates a slight blurring uh, of, the, of the horizon. Well, the atmosphere does that wherever you're looking. Uh, when you're looking straight overhead, it doesn't do it as bad as when you're looking uh, right along the highway, uh, but it's still doing it, and it makes the images blurrier than they would otherwise be. And there's also uh, water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. Of course, there's clouds, but in general, there's water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. And some observatories like ALMA, <clears throat> it is actually the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere that makes it hard to see through the Earth's atmosphere. And so if you can get above that water vapor or as, as much above it as possible, you can get better and better views of things. 
So this shows a number of observatories and it gives you their elevation in meters. Alma is uh, one of the tallest ones up here at uh, 5,000 meters. Uh, the Keck Observatory is uh, in Hawaii. And there are many telescopes in Hawaii, so including that infrared telescope facility I showed a, a couple of slides ago. It's about 4,200 uh, meters high. For those of you who prefer feet, uh, here's a similar view of some of these observatories with their elevation locations shown in feet. Again, Alma is at about 16,500. Keck is at about 14,000, as are all the other telescopes up there. The very large array in New Mexico is at about 7,000. The Kitt Peak Observatory um, outside of Tucson is uh, just a little bit lower, close to 7,000. And Mount Palomar in California, uh, which when I was growing up, this was the biggest and best uh, telescope uh, on the Earth, uh, is at about 5,600 feet. One thing I will say is that <clears throat> astronomers like for their telescopes to be as high as possible. But astronomers themselves don't always like that uh, because you need to have oxygen and there's not as much oxygen up there as there is uh, when you're down at lower elevations. And so there are uh, you know, considerations that you have to use when observing at some of these very, very high observatories. Um, <clears throat> and I like to, to tell the story that um, I have never felt worse in my life, other than when I've been legitimately sick, than at the end of the first night on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Because after an entire night of being at 14,000 feet, where there's not much oxygen, your head hurts like crazy, your body just feels like it's starting to shut down, and it's, it's not a really good feeling. They do have supplemental oxygen uh, at these really high observatories, but if you feel so bad that you have to go on supplemental oxygen, you have to go down. They won't let you stay up there <clears throat> uh, because it can be uh, quite dangerous, actually. So um, <clears throat> now Chile is another place where uh, many, many telescopes are at a number of uh, mountains. And, uh, and many, much of the research I've done has used uh, the different observatories there. <clears throat> and this map shows where many of them are. They're, the main ones are uh, north of Santiago. Alma is the furthest north uh, in the Atacama Desert. Paranal is uh, just a little bit further south than that. Paranal is where the very large telescope is. That's a, a European uh, facility. And um, as you go further south, there's a, a series of mountains, uh, Las Campanas, Cerro Tololo, and Cerro Pachon, and La Silla that are all fairly close together. And Las Campanas has a couple of pretty large telescopes known as the Magellan telescopes. Cerro Tololo is one that uh, was uh, primarily funded by the National Science Foundation and has a lot of U.S. facilities there. And it has... <clears throat> um, a fairly large telescope, the four meter uh, telescope that is sort of the twin of the largest telescope that's in uh, at Kitt Peak in Arizona. And then, um, so that's on Cerro Tololo and very close by is, uh, Cerro Pachon, where um, the Gemini telescopes are um, and where the SOAR telescope is another four meter telescope. And La Silla is, is a telescope, uh, an observatory that has several telescopes, one of them being that 3.6 meter that I showed you before, and I've done a lot of research there. And as I mentioned, astronomers, you know, we, we kind of rate telescopes by how big their mirrors are. What is the diameter? What is the size of their mirrors? And so this little graphic shows uh, many of the largest telescopes that are out there now. And showing for scale is a, a standard tennis court and a standard basketball court. And so um, the 2.7 meter at McDonald is 107 inches in diameter. And this is showing you what the size of the 100 inch telescope at Mount Wilson's observatory looks like. So this is sort of the size of one of the largest telescopes uh, in, in the continental US. But there are telescopes that are much bigger. The Keck telescopes are sort of right now the most advanced, largest operating ground-based telescopes. 
and they're about 10 meters in diameter. They're kind of in a in this hexagonal shape, and the individual mirrors aren't one giant mirror. It's actually a collection of hexagonal mirrors. But there, there's two of them, and, to, and each one of them is about 10 meters in diameter. <clears throat> and they have these multiple segments uh, due to the technology of it's kind of hard to build really big pieces of glass. But since the first one was established in 1993, we have gotten better at, big, at building fairly large single pieces of glass. And so the Gemini telescopes, one in Hawaii, one in Chile, are eight meters in diameter, and they're a single piece of glass. Uh, and there are other telescopes of roughly that size. The Very Large Telescope, which is four European telescopes, <clears throat> again, um, at Parnall, each one of them is about eight meters in diameter. But coming online um, over the next few years will be three even larger telescopes. There will be the 30 meter telescope, which is primarily a US project, lead project, uh, that is planned to be based in Hawaii on Mauna Kea. And so the diameter of that telescope will be about 30 meters. The Europeans are building the European Extremely Large Telescope, um, and it'll be about 40 meters in diameter. And then there's a group of US uh, universities and institutes that are working on something called the La Giant Magellan Telescope, which will be at Las Campanas in Chile. So both of these will be in Chile. And the Giant Magellan Telescope will be uh, <clears throat> several uh, large mirrors with an effective diameter of about 24 to 26 meters. And they should be coming online. These three telescopes should be coming online over the next um, <clears throat> uh, decade or so. Um, the Giant Magellan Telescope actually has kind of a fun name, the Extremely Large Telescope, kind of a boring name, the 30 meter telescope, kind of a boring name. We're getting bad at, at, at naming these really large telescopes. There was a, a concept for an even larger telescope uh, shown in gray that would be even much bigger that was called the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope. But that turned out to be too expensive, uh, and so that project has been canceled. I kind of felt that RICE uh, should uh, be part of that because overwhelmingly large, you could call it the OWL or the OWL telescope, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't take me up on that. So <clears throat> this is, these are kind of the, the main large telescopes that are out there right now. Well, my research area, I'll tell you a little bit about that, is in the area of star and planet formation. I, I dabble in other areas of astronomy as well, but most of my work is observationally based. So I use telescopes. I use primarily optical or infrared telescopes and also radio telescopes like ALMA to study how stars form and also to study how planets form in the disks around newly formed stars. It's uh, pretty clear that when stars are first born, they form with this surrounding material that we call a, an accretion disk or circumstellar disk. And it's in these disks that planets form. And uh, <clears throat> the basic idea of how that works was actually kind of worked out in the 18th century just by looking at our solar system. If you look at our solar system, it has some uh, interesting characteristics. And one of those is that all the planets of the solar system orbit around the sun in the same plane or very close to exactly the same plane, and that that is the equatorial plane of the sun. And if you have all planets forming in a thin disk orbiting around a star, you can naturally explain uh, why the fact that all the planets of our solar system orbit in a, in a single plane in the same direction. So we've known that planets form in disks for, for quite some time, but a lot of the details of how that happens and exactly how long it happens uh, are not uh, fully understood or fully, fully worked out yet. So that's one of the areas where a lot of my recent research has taken me. But before I, I got interested in planets around young stars, I was mostly interested in these newly formed stars themselves. And for many, many reasons, we think that these young stars, these newly formed stars that still have these disks around them, have very strong magnetic fields. 
if you've ever seen a picture of the sun, you may have seen sunspots, dark regions on the surface of the sun. And those sunspots are regions on the sun where the, the sun's magnetic field is very, very strong. The average magnetic field on the sun is not so strong. In fact, it's about the same as the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field in the unit that we me typically measure magnetic fields is about a Gauss. A Gauss is a unit of magnetic uh, field strength. And the strength of this Earth's magnetic field is about one to two Gauss. And that's about how strong the sun's field is on average. But in sunspots, which occupy only a very small piece of the sun, those magnetic fields can get much stronger. They can get up to about 3,000 Gauss, so 3,000 times the average field strength. But a lot of the theories that were developed about how young stars form and how these young stars interact with this disk of material around them said that the average magnetic field on a young star should be more like a sunspot, should be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 Gauss. So again, on average, you know, several thousand times the average strength of the field on, um, on our sun. So I've done a lot of work on measuring the magnetic fields on young stars and trying to understand how they form and how, what they do. And I've used the telescope out of McDonald, the 2.7 meters shown in the middle. Uh, I've used one of the main telescopes that I use to do this work is that NASA telescope in Hawaii, uh, the infrared telescope facility on top of Mauna Kea and also using uh, the Gemini telescope in, in uh, Chile, the largest uh, of the US telescopes in Chile right now, uh, eight meters in diameter. But most recently, I've been working a lot on uh, how planets form around, um, around these young stars, and in fact, looking for planets around uh, young stars. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that we don't really understand is when, when exactly do planets uh, form around these stars? Do they form in a million years? Do they form in 10 million years? Do they form in 100,000 years? And knowing exactly when planets form can tell you a lot about how they have to be forming. And so I've used a lot of telescopes to work on this. Um, <clears throat> as many of you are probably aware, we've have discovered something around 4,000 extrasolar planets around stars in uh, our galaxy. But most of those planets have been discovered around boring, boring stars like the sun, middle-aged stars that aren't very uh, uh, magnetically active. And as we just talked about, young stars are very magnetically active. They have magnetic fields that are reaching out to the, the disks around them. They have really large spots on them. Uh, and they have other things related to their, their magnetic activity. And it turns out the, the methods that we use to find planets around other stars can be fooled by magnetic fields uh, and the effects that they have on their stars. So um, <clears throat> up until a few years ago, there were no planets known around stars that were less than about 50 million years. Uh, <clears throat> and to give you a, an idea, the sun is about four and a half billion years old. So uh, a 50 million year old star is a very, very young star. Um, so my group has been doing a lot of work searching for planets. Uh, and the bigger the planet is, the, the easier it is to find. And a few years ago, we found the first Jupiter-sized planet uh, orbiting a star that still has a disk around it. Um, and then more recently, one of my graduate students was able to actually observe the atmosphere of this planet and to learn something about its temperature and its composition. And that is starting to let us uh, now, in a very meaningful way, test theories about how planets form. Um, <clears throat> and so, this is one of the things that my students and my colleagues and I are continuing to do is look for more planets around young stars to study them directly, to learn about their properties, to, to try and better uh, understand how these planets form. And we use ALMA to do this as well. <clears throat> uh, the star that was 
that we discovered this planet around is called C.I. Tau. And so the way astronomers name things, the planet is known as C.I. Tau lowercase b. If it was C.I. Tau uppercase b, that would mean that it's another uh, <clears throat> It's another star orbiting the star, but if it's a if it's a lowercase b, it means it's a planet orbiting the star. So this is a, a an image on the left, a, a true image of CI Tau uh, taken with Alma, but on a on a much larger uh, physical scale. This is on a scale that is bigger than the scale of Pluto's orbit around uh, the sun. So this is on the scale of the entire solar system. And one of the things that Alma is really good at doing is imaging the gas and dust that are in these disks around newly formed stars. And what Alma discovered is th this thing that looks bright in the middle that you might think is the star is actually just the inner part of the disk. On this scale, the star is so incredibly small that you can't see the individual star. Everything you're seeing here is emission coming from the gas and dust in the disk. But what you see is that, that there are these evacuated lanes in this disk. And one of the things that was predicted long before this, these were seen is that when planets, particularly massive planets like Jupiter or Saturn form, that will evacuate the material in these disks around, uh, around a newly formed star. So this image uh, taken with Alma has, is now providing evidence that not only is there a Jupiter that's really, really close to the star, because the, the Jupiter that we discovered was very, very close to the star, much closer than Mercury is to our sun. So not only is there that Jupiter there, but there's at least three other planets because we see three other dark lanes in this uh, Alma image. And the mass of those things are on the size of Jupiter and Saturn. And <clears throat> you can estimate the mass by just how big these rings are and how dark they are. That tells you something about how big the planet has to be that's there. So um, <clears throat> uh, this is a full-fledged solar system, but not like our solar system in that it has small rocky planets and big massive planets. It might have small rocky planets. We, we just don't have good ways of discovering those right now around uh, stars like this, very, very young stars. But it has at least four massive planets around it. Well, so I do uh, uh, a lot of astronomy. I do a lot of teaching astronomy. Uh, that you know, is uh, my career. But I do do other things for fun. And kind of my main uh, pastime outside of astronomy is ballroom dancing. I have even been coerced by my teacher. This is my teacher here, Lisa. She is the professional. We competed in a, a pro-am uh, dance tournament uh, several years ago. Um, and we were doing a waltz. Uh, so unfortunately, the lighting was a little bit low, so the picture didn't come out quite so uh, sharp uh, we, while we were actually dancing. But this is us uh, dancing the waltz. Um, and I won a gold medal. Uh, so now this was in the, the beginner's level. So, you know, don't look for me on Dancing with the Stars or anything like that. But um, it is one of the things uh, that I really enjoy doing. Um, and then I thought I'd take just a couple of minutes to say just a few things about astronomy more broadly at Rice and then uh, be happy to open it up for questions. Um, so <clears throat> I, I'm in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. We have many physicists and we have many astronomers. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a picture of our small observatory on top of Brockman Hall at Rice. In terms of uh, the cast of characters that do astrophysics related uh, research, there's Three of us right now that work in this general field of star and planet formation. I put a question mark here, not because I don't know what the fourth person looks like, but because we're hiring somebody this year and uh, we haven't uh, finished that whole process. So I don't know who the fourth person will actually be, but there'll be four of us in this general field of star and planet formation. There's five of us uh, that work in the field of relativistic astrophysics and cosmology and two folks that work uh, on solar physics, studying the sun. Uh, and so this is Pat Hartigan. This is me. This is Andrea Asella. Uh, this is Mustafa Amin. 
Matthew Bering, Edison Liang, Andrew Long, and Chris Tunnell. And then David Alexander and Stephen Bradshaw are the, the other two down here. We do have a telescope um, on campus um, <clears throat> and it is, it is relatively small. So it's 16 inches in diameter. So it's bigger than my little six inch telescope, but certainly not as big as uh, the other telescopes that I use professionally. You know, Houston's not the greatest place in the world to uh, look through a telescope, so we don't really do uh, any research with this, though we're at, we've actually purchased what, what you see at the end of the telescope here is an eyepiece that you can look through. We have purchased uh, a new camera for the telescope and a new spectrometer for the telescope, so we're going to start trying to do some, some simple uh, research projects that would really be appropriate for undergraduate students. But we do use this telescope for public viewing. In, in non-COVID times, we typically have open houses at the observatory at least once a month. We invite the public to come in and look through the telescope. Uh, and it can provide really fantastic views of the planets of our solar system, of some of the brighter nebula uh, and star clusters that are out there, and even a few galaxies. Um, so. Uh, as everybody gets vaccinated, as things hopefully start to return to normal, and all, we will be having uh, these public viewing sessions again. And so I invite everybody to come out and join us. Um, they, if you search uh, for physics and astronomy on the Rice website, you'll go to the department um, webpage and there's a link there for the observatory and, and all these open houses get shown there. Um, so with that, I think I will uh, stop my presentation and um, see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, so we have one question that popped through the chat. So we'll do that one first and then we'll open it up to anyone who come up here. Um, I see there. So, how far away is uh, from Earth is CI Tau? Um, so, CI Tau is 140 parsecs. Uh, and one parsec is 3.26 light years. So it is about 450 light years uh, from the Earth, which means that it's very close by in our galaxy. The galaxy is about 100,000 light years across and about 1,000 light years thick. Uh, and so this is 450 light years away. So that means it's, it's quite close to the Earth uh, within our own galaxy. Um, <clears throat> and how will we find other large planets that appear to inhabit that system? Is it just a matter of taking time to look at those areas or other methods needed? Well, uh, so ALMA is, is greatly helping find where uh, the planets are by looking at, at these gaps. Uh, and um, the James Webb Space Telescope should be able to see the, the planets that are in the gaps of those uh, disks around stars directly. Um, and even ALMA uh, is able to do that slightly. I have a picture from something that one of my colleagues does that I, um, if we had had a little bit more time, I was going to show. But <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, one of the astronomers at Rice is Andrea Asella. He's done a lot of work with the ALMA array as well. And so this is a disk around another young star. Uh, and you can see these two tiny little blobs that, that are actually real. A lot of tests have been done on them. <clears throat> and uh, these are two planets that are just inside of a big gap in uh, the disk around a particular star known as PDS 70. And so there's two, two newly discovered planets. This was only a couple of years ago, a little over a year ago, that, that these were discovered. So we're starting to see uh, those. Um, and as I said, um, the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to more easily directly image uh, the telescopes in the gaps of uh, CI Tau and any other star um, that uh, similarly has a disk and gaps around it. And the James Webb Telescope hopefully will launch in the next couple of years. Thank you. Does anyone else want oh. to come off mute and ask a question? 
Uh, yeah, Professor Johns Cole, this is Mike Monarchy again. Um, mm -hmm. What is the current thinking in astronomy about why only certain areas in the disk, uh, now I'm not sure what the right word is, but accrue or coagulate, if you will, to form planets where the remainder of the uh, disk just stays as loose space dust and other matter? Well, so uh, there, there's a, a number of physical things that are happening that are related to that. It, it turns out that when a planet does form, its gravitational influence is such that another planet can't exist in a orbit, a stable orbit too close to it because their mutual gravitational tug will start to pull on each other. And if the second planet is too close to the first, it will upset the orbit of one or the other, or perhaps both. And the way it typically works out is the more massive planet basically stays there and it flings the less massive planet out of the solar system or maybe into the sun. Uh, in fact, we think that that's one of the ways that the earth got some of its water is that, that young planetary embryo type things way out near Jupiter that were mainly made of water ice and methane ice, got too close to Jupiter, got flung by Jupiter either out far away from the solar system to make what we call the Oort cloud of comets, uh, or got flung to the inner solar system, or some of them hit the Earth and brought water to the Earth, but most of them wound up being flung into uh, the sun and, and were evaporated uh, into the sun. So you can't have even if planets did form pretty close together, they can't stay there for very long. They have to be kind of spaced out in a, into a safe distance. Um, but part of your question is based on just how do planets form? Uh, small planets like the Earth, mainly rocky planets, probably form relatively close to their sun uh, because the light elements never uh, coagulate into dust particles. Uh, the temperature is just too high and the, the volatile elements remain in gaseous form and never become anything solid. But once you get these small dust particles forming and they run into each other, they can stick together and build up bigger and bigger things. But that takes a while. Um, it can, and it may take millions of years. Some people think that's how Jupiter formed as well that way out in, in our uh, <clears throat> solar system, that you had these small dust particles colliding together, sticking together, growing into bigger and bigger things until finally you had enough mass there. And when I say enough mass, I mean like 10 times the mass of the earth, such that its gravity pulled in the gas to form Jupiter. But we really think that takes at least 10 million years to do. Um, there's a, another theory out there that says, actually, if the, if the disks around those stars are massive enough or big enough, they will become unstable to their own gravity, and you can really quickly collapse to form a Jupiter, kind of like pieces of our galaxy collapse to form stars. Stars form from big clouds of gas and dust in our galaxy that become unstable to their own gravity and collapse in on, on themselves maybe the same thing happens to form a planet like Jupiter. And that might only take 500,000 years. And so that's one of the reasons that myself and Andrea and others look for planets that, uh, around stars that are maybe two, three million years old. Because if we find planets around those stars, then that means it doesn't take 10 million years to form them. It means that it takes a shorter time to form them. And so by finding planets around these very young stars, we can start to test which of these ideas of planet formation is in fact what's actually happening. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else wanna come off and ask a question? Yeah, uh, Mike Mueller here. Um, notwithstanding your discussion so far on um, the our own solar system and where the rocky and gaseous planets are. Is there evidence that you buy into for any major radial um, movement over say the scale of hundreds of millions to billions of years of any of our, um, of our major planets uh, in, in our solar system? 
So uh, it is almost certainly true that the planets uh, of our solar system have moved from their original birthplaces. The outer planets, particularly Neptune, uh, are slowly moving uh, in their orbits. And the, the evidence for that, again, comes from the way that these planets gravitationally interact with small things like comets and like asteroids. And what we have discovered are um, rings, if you will, of cometary bodies in orbit at distances greater than, um, uh, than the outer planets. And the way they are stacked up uh, shows evidence of past movement of, of planets like Neptune. Uh, there's also some uh, ideas, one of the most famous models out there is called the Grand Tack model that describes how Jupiter probably migrated in from its uh, location in the early part of our solar system. And then Saturn also migrated in and when it caught up to Jupiter, their mutual gravitational interaction actually started to pull them back out again. Um, <clears throat> and so what, what we do know is that there are um, massive planets like Jupiter really close to stars, to some stars. Um, CI Tau is one example, but around main sequence stars, around stars like the sun, there are many other examples. And there is no credible theory that explains how those planets could form where they are currently. But there are theories that say, that explain how a planet could form far from its star and then migrate inwards. In fact, that original idea was suggested before the first extrasolar planet was ever discovered. And people didn't pay any attention to that model because they said, well, that's, that obviously can't be right. That's not the way Jupiter is in our solar system. You must have made a mistake. But then we started discovering lots of Jupiter-sized planets really close to their stars. And these guys said, aha, my model was correct. Um, and then we actually have to come up with an explanation for why Jupiter is where it is. Um, the Grand Tack model is one way to do that. Uh, but there are some other ideas out there. So the bottom line is, I would say, there's very good evidence that planets move around from their birth locations. Um, I wondered if you could recommend some basic um, reading material for in advance of our trip. Oh, uh, well, it depends a little bit on um, you know exactly what your interest is. Uh, there are um, a number of popular science books uh, on um, on extra, extrasolar planets, um, and uh, some of the work, as I mentioned, some of the work that I do, and, and a lot of the work that's been done at Chile is focused on finding those, on finding these. Um, <clears throat> the the one that I am most familiar with was written by Donald Goldsmith, and I'm most familiar with it because I did the scientific editing for that one. Uh, but that was published many years ago. There are more recent books that are out there now. Um, I can send Shannon uh, a list of maybe some, some books that you might want to take a look at, um, and uh, she can put it, you know, on the, I guess, the Facebook or send it out in, in an email. But there are, there are a number of sort of popular science books that, um, that cover that topic. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the other really exciting things, it's not exactly related to my research at all, but it's certainly something that uh, the Southern Skies and observatories in Chile played a huge role in that uh, has occurred over the, the past few years, is the, the imaging of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, and I'm sure that there are some popular science books or, uh, about that, uh, but I would have to look those up because they're not, again, they're not my particular area of research. But um, only within the past couple of years, we now actually have a, a, a picture of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And that, that was a really exciting thing that, that came out uh, just recently. Thanks. So one last question from me. Uh, what, where do you do your learning and training for your ballroom dancing? Yeah, well, um, so I first started doing that uh, at the River Oak School of Dance, 
um, <clears throat> which is uh, I actually know that one. Okay, so so my teacher was teaching there, um, and but um, I forget a year, two years into doing it, um, the ownership of that studio changed, and my teacher moved to a, a different studio, and so I kind of followed her. Uh, she now owns her own dance studio. It's called Love Dance Houston. It's up in the Sawyer Yards area, um, and uh, and she offers ballroom dancing classes there. May have to check that out. Thank you. You know, we did um, kind of market this event as a happy hour. Um, and yeah, so I, I wish I could, ask, I was going to ask, you know, these travelers, they may want to know they'll be dining and traveling with you. What is your beverage of choice or what are you drinking tonight? Well, tonight I'm, I'm drinking a mint julep because um, the, the Kentucky Derby was a couple weeks ago and we've got the next round coming up. Um, uh, you know, the, the wines of South America, I'm also very interested in, and I, I know that's part of, of the trip as well. So, um, but if I had to pick one cocktail, it would probably be a Manhattan. I know we're a little over time, but are there any other questions? just burning that you've got to get asked right now while oh, we've got them. Okay. Well, not to fear. If any other questions do pop up, you are welcome to send those to travelingowls at rice.edu and I will connect with Professor John Scroll and we'll, we'll get you an answer um, and I will also connect with him about the book recommendation so we can get that sent out to you all as well. I think that was a great question. Um, I do want to thank Professor Christopher Johns Kroll, John Royal, and Carla White from Royal Adventures, and all of you guys for joining us this evening. Um, this will be recorded and available, so if you want to kind of watch back or learn more, I know there was a couple things I took some notes on that I'm like, I need to go back and, <laughs> and see what he said about that. Um, that will be available to you guys and we'll email out the recording. If any other questions pop up that are specific or faculty specific, you can reach out to Royal Adventures directly or again, myself, Traveling Owls at Rice Study to you. And if I don't know the answer, I'll work with them to get you the right answer or connect you directly if that's what you prefer. Um, again, thank you so much for everyone for joining with us this evening and enjoy the rest of your night. Bye. Thank you.